The man is a demon, and I never take a demon as a prisoner. He is your enemy, American. He hates and he kills. He is the devil. We want you to kill this evil. No! I... Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, I got uh, got Ian here. Ian Urza. Hello, sir. Hey, how's it going? Really uh, thankful for this uh, opportunity. I've always loved this show and it's fun to be a part of it. Yay! Well, we'll see how you feel after. You'll probably be like, man, what a mistake. <laughs> what have I done? Well, it's, it's it's funny. I feel like I'm the only person in the world who would say, uh, let's do strike commando. <laughs> you know, like cause it, when you were messaging me, like pick some movies out that you might want to cover on the show. I'm like, I kind of want to do strike commando with you. I feel like that would be a fun show to do. It's a subgenre that we've never touched on this show, which is uh, Italian action. In fact, I this might be like maybe not the first action movie, but we're pretty close to like untouched freaking genre excitement here well when me when greg and i covered the last hunter on land of the creeps uh for a bonus episode i talked a little bit about the macaroni combat genre as it's sometimes called and uh <laughs> nomsploitation is yes. even more of a specific part of it because <laughs> in the early 80s like the italians had been making war movies before that but they were all like world war ii based including uh, one specific one, actually, I think Dario Argento had a hand in writing, uh, probab- uh, Probability Zero with uh, Henry Silva. Oh, and wow. then you had uh, Inglorious Bastards, probably the most infamous of all of the, the macaroni combat movies, obviously, because of the remake. But then in 1980, Antonio Margheriti makes The Last Hunter, and that brought a new breath to the genre in a way because they started making Vietnam movies. And uh, Margariti went on to make several ones that were sort of mercenary based, but then Bruno Mattei had his hand in it in the late eighties and all <laughs> five of the movies that he made in the late eighties are ones that I love. Like it's my, I like Bruno Mattei's movies actually. And, but my favorite ones are like the five or six action movies he directed. Robo Wars a little separate, yeah. but he did yeah. strike commando, strike commando Two, cop game, double target and born to fight. All five of those are basically, um, macaroni combat films combined with ripoffs of other movies. Uh, well, and, well, uh, I think you're talking about Vincent Dawn. Yes, Vincent Dawn. Uh, I don't know who this the, Bruno guy is. <laughs> Vincent Dawn. It, it, it also the the perfect name for like a porn director. Vincent <laughs> Dawn. <laughs> so yes, this is Strike Commando from 1987. Uh, we're gonna do some spoilers, but this is one of those movies where we can spoil it for you, but honestly, we can't. You have to see this thing to believe it. Bruno Mattei as Vincent Don. We got uh, co co writer with uh, Clyde Anderson, aka yep. Claudio Fragasso or Fragasso, and of course um, a a person that's come up I think on a Jeffrey episode uh, is Rosella Drudy. Yeah, she was. Um, I don't know if she's married to Claudio Fragasso, but I do know that they were like boyfriend and girlfriend. Maybe they still are. Uh, yeah. They were writing uh, collaborators on pretty much anything he did. And most of the time from like basically the early 80s to 1990, he was working with Matei on everything. I believe they had some sort of a falling out on Night Killer for whatever reason. I don't know why, (laughs) but that was the movie where they kind of they kind of disbanded after that. I had a falling out with myself for picking Night Killer to watch because, man. Oh, I kind of like that one, actually. It's it's not I. 
It was this. It was the. Uh, it was the erotic stuff. It was the the not quite rapey. The, it was the the hostage situation, kind of like the sexy hostage thing. I was like, it's it might just be got, the sleazy. It might be too sleazy for me. Yeah, you got you got the woman in that from uh, Silent Night Deadly Night giving a way worse performance than she ever did in Silent Night Deadly Night, <laughs> and you got Peter Hutton who's just out of control in that movie. Oh my god. What was she in Silent Night, Deadly Night? She was the mother at the beginning who gets shot and yeah. holy shit. Yeah, that was that's her. I never knew. Thank you. That's hilarious. I can't remember the actress's name, but yeah, is, she it is was, uh, Melanie Beck. Oh, no, wait, yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's her character's name. Tara Buckman is the name. Yeah, Tara Buckman. That's right. Yeah, that's so funny. Wow. Wow, you just made a connection to my brain. I never had. Yeah, it's like it's a thing where Bruno Mattei and we will talk about this as we go on. But like Bruno Mattei would have been to me actually a really good like second unit director of action, because if you see the action scenes in his films, they're actually pretty good. I would I, at least I would dare to say. And he uses the budget well. Um, yeah. Uh, Brent Huff talked about this at one point, you know, while making Strike Commando 2. He just said, we could use all the ammo we wanted. We didn't care about that stuff. So, <laughs> and, and, and he, there's sh- sh- uh, uh, definitely no shortage of uh, explosions as well. No. But when it comes to directing an entire film, uh, <laughs> there are some issues with Bruno Mattei's direction, especially like dramatic scenes. And he makes every single actor that is normally a pretty good dramatic actor or at least better than they would be if they were in a Matei movie. They're all kind of worse <laughs> in, in whatever he's doing for the, for the <laughs> dramatic scenes. Like not that Reb Brown's a very good dramatic actor, but I think he's better at other movies with it than he is in this and his yeah. performance in this. I've always described as just an immaculate performance because it's <laughs> so incredibly bad that it's so incredibly entertaining. It's transcendent. So here's a here's a trailer. Um, I found this freaking bizarro trailer. The my issue with Italian trailers most of the time is that there's there's three minutes and there's not a lot of voiceover. There's not that cool voiceover guy. And it's just all the best beats in the movie. And so I I was just going to play a small snippet of the Italian one. But then I found something marked in production trailer. It's two minutes, but it has a very, very, um, I've never done a voiceover before voiceover guy. So we're going to play 30 seconds or so of this thing. Um, it almost sounds like a fan made, but they're probably just trying to sell the movie to, uh, to, uh, distributors, uh, pre-sales as they used to do. So here's that trailer. Strike Commando. When they sent Mike Ranson into Vietnam to blow up a vital bridge, they didn't bargain on him getting out alive. But Mike Ranson is a highly skilled member of Strike Commando. And there's just two things on his mind. Survival and revenge. Strike Commando. Coming soon. I'm not going to read the paragraph from the back because I just usually just grab the, the, the plot synopsis from the back of these VHS tapes. But the uh, International Video Entertainment Incorporated uh, VHS tape it is a full, long paragraph detailing the entire movie. So instead of that, I'm just going to go with the IMDb, which says, In the Vietnam War, an American soldier survives a botched mission with help from a group of locals who perceive him as a hero. He's sent back for a reconnaissance mission, only to find his helpers massacred by a brutal Russian soldier. Uh, 92 minutes. Nailed it. Before we jump into the plot, we've got music by uh, Luigi uh, Cecciarelli. I'm I'm brutalizing these names. I'm brutal. Uh, He did Rats, Knights of Terror, and he did uh, Vampire in Venice, which uh, Vampire in Venice, very special movie. I want to cover that on this show one of these days. Uh, we got cinematography by Ricardo Grassetti, who was shot, uh, God help him, uh, Zombie 3, Robo War, and Shocking Dark. Okay, so I'm a Matei collaborator there. Exactly. Uh, Zombie 3. Zombie 3, I actually think is pretty good. I love I actually it. think – I think Matei stepped his game up for that one a little bit more than usual. I think he knew that 
I kind of have to try on this film because it's technically a Lucio. It's Lucio Fulci's name is on it. So I'm going to try a little harder. I've always thought that that movie felt like a Resident Evil video game more than almost any Resident (laughs) Evil uh, movie does. Minus the new one, uh, the Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, which I actually think feels more like a Resident Evil game than any of the other ones. Totally. Oh, man. Good call. Yeah. No, Zombie 3, never a dull moment ever. No slack on that one. Um, Robo War, I, you know, I liked it okay, but I would never sit through it again. It, it was where them imitating, that was the Predator one, right? Yes. Yeah, it's like Predator and RoboCop combined. Yeah. And it just it just got, some of the stuff got where I, I actually wished I was watching Predator. Whereas with Shocking That's- Dark, <laughs> I didn't feel that way. I felt... Because Shocking Dark is Alien meets Aliens. Terminator, and I love that. Yeah, with some with some actually pretty decent effects work on the Terminator guy at the end, I will oh, say. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah, Shocking Dark. That's something special. I wonder if Stivaletti had a hand in the effects in that one. I don't remember, because they almost look like his kind of effects, but I don't I don't know. Uh, Maybe. Yeah. Uh, as, far as, as far as the cast goes, uh, this is led by our friend and yours, Reb Brown, as Sergeant Michael Ransom. Um, Red Brown, I forgot that he was your the hunter from the future. <laughs> Completely dropped the ball. I hadn't thought of that movie in years. He's in the Howling too, as well. I think. Yes, that is the other thing I'm like that I'm all fired up about Howling too. Um, that is one of those movies I hated the first time, and then the second time I was like, I, how could I have hated this? And that led me to, of course, Howling Three, which is even crazier. <laughs> like. He was also the Woo. the backup running back to O.J. Simpson at USC. Well, you know me, Mr. Sports. <laughs> you barely <laughs> yeah. beat me to that. No, you. That's that's incredible. Yeah. Well, one day he, you know, O.J. turned him and said, "You should be in movies," and he's like, "I'm on it." Yeah. Both of them had pretty competent movie careers. Uh, Crazy OJ Crazy. up until a certain point. It's funny. I don't know. It's it's one of those things. I watch. I can watch the three Naked Gun movies, and I'm like, did he ruin these movies for me or not? It's hard. It's like one of those things. Every <laughs> CD's in. I'm like, oh, I wish he was. I yeah. wish him, this was someone else. I wish this was like Bernie Casey or something. Yeah, stop <laughs> being a stop being a murderer. Yeah. Uh, next up, of course, we've got uh, Christopher Connolly who plays Colonel Raddick, and uh, Christopher Connolly from everyone's favorite Manhattan baby. No, not my favorite. <laughs> no, it's, it, I, uh, it is no one's there's favorite. No, there's, there's no, I, I can't even, I, I can't even play sarcastic with that one, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I love Christopher it. Conley I love it. But it, it's one of those movies that I totally get why people don't like it. It just is. I'm so desperate for Fulci from that era that that opened up to me after I was like dying to see it again. And I was like, whoa, this is just like a B-side, like a bad B-side to a great record. You know, it's just it's more of the same, but not. I love I love Manhattan Baby. But yeah, no no defending it. Christopher Connolly is giving uh, Cameron Mitchell a run for his money in this one on the the sweat factor. Yes. He's He's sweating like crazy. God, can you? I mean, I can't imagine filming under these conditions, and I live in Florida. <laughs> I think, I, I'm like, what did what did Christopher Connolly do throughout the 1970s? Because like he must have like smoked a lot of cigarettes or drank a lot. Because <laughs> you look at the way he aged. If you look at, at at pictures of him when he was young, like when he was in a bunch of sitcoms and stuff, and you're like, geez, yeah. what happened in those 10 or 15 years? Because if once you see him in like Bronx in the Bronx Warriors in the early 80s, he's he just looks he looks rough. Yeah, had to be smoking and, and drinking. He was like, water, I've got whiskey here. <laughs> he is a he is a badass in uh, Raiders of Atlantis, though. Love him in that movie. Yeah, I just got that Blu-ray and, and watched it um, with Movie Party Crew, where we watched it and, and tweeted about it before we gave up on Twitter. And I yeah, I really enjoyed that. That was a instant favorite. And I don't know how I'd missed it for so long. I think it was because I just had the VHS rip, and I was just like, this has got to have a DVD one of these days. And then fast forward and suddenly it had a Blu-ray. It's like, yay. Uh, we've got um, a good old Louise Comstig as Olga, the, the Russian uh, soldier. She, this lady, I've only seen her in, was it Naked You Die? No, Fashion Crimes. And oh, she was in uh, Bloody Psycho. 
Those are the ones I know her from. Uh, I have not seen her in anything else, so not that I know of anyway. I know I'm mixing up Bloody Psycho with um, Massacre. Oh, I got something to look forward to. Hey, hey, Italian horror I haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, yeah. Then we got good old Luciano Pagazzi from everything. He plays La Due. He's one of those people who, um, I mean, he's he pl- he worked in every genre you can kind of yep. think of from the 60s to, you know, the late 80s. And he uh, in, in the 80s, he started he was he's like he's like a character actor superstar in the 80s because he appeared in a ton of the the macaroni combat movies, like almost oh, every yeah. one of the ones uh, Margariti made or uh, or Bruno Mattei made. He was in them. And a lot of the actually a lot of the Mattei ones, you, if you look at his filmography, a lot of his scenes were deleted. Like he was in a couple of other ones, but his scenes were deleted for whatever reason, though he does appear at double target and he gets just about as bad of a death in that one as he does in this. I remember. <laughs> yeah, he he's in his beardo phase in this one where he's just like every movie he shows up in, his beard is just bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, he's definitely having fun here. So far as I can tell, it's not like um, the bloodsucker leads the dance where he just looks like he's ashamed of himself. <laughs> <laughs> that rape scene in that movie is it, it's like, man. You done him dirty by making him do that. Get out of here with that shit. I would love to see people's reactions when that gets a freaking Blu-ray one day. <laughs> <laughs> it's just freaking hideous. Uh, we got Alex Vitale as the most important character, Jakota. This guy. Oh, man. I don't recognize. Him. I don't know what character he played in the movie, but like the other one I've seen with him was hands of steel but he had like a bit part in hands of steel oh no he was, was he? in uh beyond the door three what i'm trying to oh think of God. who he played I, I hands of steel is my i'm kind of ashamed that i didn't recognize him because if he's in that i i just he i'm trying to like remember a security guard oh okay <laughs> yeah it's like i'll have to look for him next time because it. it's one of those things where i wasn't even thinking about that that is that is my favorite of the italian post-apocalyptic movies i love that film so. yeah I've seen Hands of Steel, but it was like like years ago when the uh, on a on a a rip I found of the VHS tape. I don't remember it at all. I remember that. Yeah, scene. It, it's uh, I, I, Daniel Green, Daniel Green and like Brent Huff. But Daniel Green, for sure, are like my two favorite stars of like late 80s Italian genre films. And Daniel Green worked with Sergio Martino a lot. Like he was in like five of Sergio Martino's films from that time because he's in uh, American Rickshaw. He's in uh, the movie The Opponent that Sergio Martino did, the boxing movie. Ooh, I haven't heard of uh, that one. And uh, what's it? I think Operation Condor or something like that, where he plays like a he plays like a journalist. And it's very similar to like the Uncharted video games. I've heard people compare that movie to those a lot. So, OK, yeah. Uh, so a character uh, named Major Harriman is played by two people, uh, Major Harriman or Harry Mann. Either way, he's Harry. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a uh, Mike Monty and who's in tons of stuff. Zombie three. He's basically oh. playing the same character he played in Zombie three. Yeah, tons of stuff. But also, he was voiced by William Berger. Yep. According to the trivia, and I was like, whoa, that's incredible. I didn't know that until I looked it up. Until I saw it, yeah, that he was. <laughs> yeah, so, oh man, imagine William Berger just in that scene because like William Berger was so busy in the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, some movie where he was in 11 movies in one year. Oh, it was Dial Help. Uh, Dial Gerald Help, yeah. He, played the, he shows up at the airport because his heart I, explodes or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm in 11 movies this year, so I can meet you at the airport. And we're like, well, we'll write our, the scene in the airport instead of a library. Talk about another Italian genre movie that needs a Blu-ray, Dial Help. Thank you. That's one of my favorite first time watches from last year. Blew me away. And the really. washing machine. Oh man. Yeah. A washing machine. I'd like to see again. I don't know if I'd buy it. I liked it, but we I, got, I, we got, we got a phantom of death Blu-ray. I'm happy about I that. Know. What the hell? That's great. Dial help. That's next level. So anyway, that's, that's my main picks from the cast. Those are my main. I peeps. had one more to add to you. Got? Um, it's, it, it's a guy in a small role. I'm trying to find him. Renee. Abadeza, he plays the Viet Cong soldier that Red Brown is like, take me to Dakota. Um, and he, you know, he tries to he tries to stab him in the back and Red Brown ends up killing him. He's another guy who appeared in a ton of these 
uh, movies in the eighties. Like he's in a ton of uh, Matei's other films, um, and I recognize him. I'm like he plays he plays like a Viet Cong soldier or one of those in every single one of these movies. So you, if you see any uh, of, of the other films, you'd recognize him from those. Nice. Hey there, folks. It's editor Richard cutting in here. Um, I totally forgot, and I think Ian forgot too. There's this really racist joke at the beginning of this movie. It's seriously one of the first lines of dialogue in this movie. It pertains to watermelon, and it is not good. It is, um, uh, I mean, I don't expect, uh, you know, the Italian filmmakers of this era to be progressive or anything, but for a movie made this late in the 80s and they're still throwing that kind of crap around, it's, <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, it never comes up again, and the movie has other racial issues to deal with, as we'll talk about as we go along. But, yeah, just want to give you a heads up. It's gross and bad, but what are you going to do? Movie is made, and as much as I've tried, I can't unmake it. Back to the show. Uh, so the movie starts, we get this uh, this fateful mission, and uh, my favorite thing about this this fateful mission is that um, holding still makes you invisible. So, so, <laughs> uh, so Reb Brown as Mr. Ransom, they're going into this this uh, Vietnam Vietnamese base to 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 wreck shit. And every time the searchlight passes over them, they just hold really still. And even though they're completely illuminated and they're the shapes of soldiers, they're invisible. It's great. Radic and his team, they're not strike commandos. They're the support crew who are out there. They have the place wired to explode, and Radic is going to blow everybody up because he doesn't want the mission to fail. And Ransom's superior officer is there. Just give him time. Give him time. And he doesn't give them time, and he blows the shit up while the strike commandos, so all of the strike commandos are killed except our pal Ransom. Uh, and he, he magically turns into a tree and, and floats down the river. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he had to have been underwater for what? Hours? <laughs> Just yeah. Hours. Just brain dead for hours. And then he's discovered by some very desperate uh, Vietnamese people who, who rescue him. One of my favorite things about him waking up is the ghostly faces. So all of these people <laughs> just start screaming and they look and, like Then you get ghosts. Red Brown's first crazy scream of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's hanging upside down, but they cut him loose. What is this dynamic with him and these people? Uh, Ian, what is going it's, on? It's almost like it, it's weirdly serendipitous filmmaking because it's like it's almost like the biggest stereotype <laughs> you could think of, like the white savior. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's it, uh, yeah. That it's, was it's funny how like this movie is almost like parodying the white savior idea. And I don't even think it's intentional. Lietta was watching this with me and she, her jaw dropped when they were just worshiping him like American, American, American. And she's like, what is going on here? It's like, I don't know. We got a white savior problems. <laughs> yeah, he's there with uh, with Lau, his new buddy. He makes friends with this one kid. And Luciano Pagazzi's there is La Due, the, the the French soldier who's now uh, just, you know, like a freedom fighter. They try to get him to kill someone, but he won't do it. And La Due explains to him, like, oh, you let him down, man. You can't show mercy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird. So they go on a, a trek together. So he's they're going to help him on his mission to go kill... He's looking for Radic, who betrayed him, but he's also looking for these Russians. It's the the plot is murky here. I, I'm not crazy, right? It's sort of uh, like no. I think is, I, is well, I actually simple? think Pagosi is the one who talks to them about Russians being there. Um, oh, okay, I think he's just yeah. I think he's just leading them through. I think he ends up uh, wanting to liberate them because when oh, he yeah. yeah when he gets. When he gets back and Radek basically does like the whole Rambo 2 thing, go take some photographs to make sure we know that there are Russians there. He's like, OK, only under the condition that you liberate the people who are with me. So I think that that was what he was going for at a certain gotcha. point. I, mean, I think he I think he, uh, he he basically wants to become a father to Lao as soon as he meets him for whatever yeah. reason. They talk about going to Disneyland together. So, yeah, yeah, get them to Saigon and get them out. Yeah. 
I think I overthought it. <laughs> Cause it was just like Jakarta. <laughs> uh, so he ends up blowing up a boat, which is there's two blowing up a boat scenes that feature one of my favorite things in this movie, which is grenades with really, really long fuses. Yeah. Which I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like the second blow up, is he just activating the grenades, or is there another fuse attached to it? Like, because I didn't even think about that. Actually, one of the best examples of that in films is uh, Die Hard Two. I don't know if you know the scene I'm talking about, but Die Hard Two has a scene where they're where uh, William Sadler and all his men are tossing the grenades into like the plane that McLean is taking cover in. And the, the grenades, they toss them in and it's like a solid minute before anything happens. I'm like, the fuse on a grenade is like five <laughs> seconds. If that, it's, I don't even think it is that. Yeah, so. it's very, the, the time is, uh, fuse time is very fluid. In this movie. <laughs> Ransom meets back up with, with his buddies, with Lau and the rest of the, the freedom fighters. They've been slaughtered. They've been completely slaughtered. And the only one left alive is Lau. And they talk about a very special place. Ian, what very special place did they talk about? Disneyland. What does he say? Like cotton candy grows on trees. There's yep. like chocolate and, and, and malt. And, and any wish could be granted to you by the, the magic genie. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, it's such a great, it's like, it's, it's such a, it's so, it's, it's such a, it's such a terrible performance by Red Brown that it's so good. Like, is just his emoting is 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 is, is amazing. His his ugly crying is so good. I love his ugly crying. Come on, tell me, tell me about Disneyland. They got tons of popcorn there. Yeah. And all you gotta do is go climb a tree to go eat it. <laughs> And there's cotton candy, mountains of it, and chocolate milk, and baldness. And there's a genie, a magic genie. And he can't wait to grant your wishes. Tell me the most important three syllable word in this entire film. Just that scream. And then he, then he, then he, it's it, Red Brown has like different levels of crescendos to his scream. So he first, he like yells it, but then he like really screams it. Like he's like, oh <laughs> the second time he does it, like it's, it's, it's so good how he, it's and I've always said this, you know, and I got this from uh, I think it was Brian Clark of the Attack of the Killer podcast. He's like, I think Reb Brown thinks that his scream like increases bullet velocity. It does. <laughs> and it like increases the damage. Like I've always thought his his screaming, I think he thinks is like the, the stopping power perk from like Call of Duty where this nice. like or the rapid fire attachment on, uh, you know, like on guns where you, it just makes the gun fire faster or do more damage. Um, it's uh, he does it. it he does it a lot in this movie and in Robo War. Dakota! To to age myself for with a video game reference, it's when you scream "Heavy Barrel" and then yeah. you kill everyone on the screen with one shot because that's what Heavy Barrel does. Heavy Barrel. <laughs> You're welcome, everybody at home who remembers Heavy Barrel. Wow. There's two. Jakotas that are like my favorite Jakota. There's, I mean, there's many Jakotas, but this is my favorite. So the first one is the one where he's carrying Lao, the dead Lao, and he's got that echo. So there's an echo effect on the Jakota. But then two minutes later, two minutes of screen time later, he's got his big, like, I want to say the big machine gun, not of M60. 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 Thank you. I was never going to remember that. Um, So the M60, and then he suspects that Jakota is in a, in a hut and just screams Jakota three times while firing this machine gun. It's glorious. It is so good. He's still mad about Disneyland. (laughs) So my favorite scene 
uh, and my favorite Reb Brown voice acting or just acting with his, his beautiful voice moment is when he goes and destroys the big boat, not the little boat, the big boat. And this time <laughs> he, sneaks on the, up. he sneaks on the boat and he's got, again, grenades that have two minute long fuses <laughs> because that's how that's how <laughs> grenades work. And he <laughs> throws tons of grenades in this thing. And as he's trying to escape, which it doesn't make any sense because he's killed everyone on the boat. He doesn't even have to blow it up anymore. He just take the boat and keep it. But no, he's determined to blow it up. And uh, as he's trying to escape, one of the guys he thought was dead is alive and attacking him. And the, you know, the clock's ticking. You can't stay on a boat full of grenades forever. So finally he kills this guy, <laughs> tells him, like, shut up, <laughs> and then kills him. And then as he's jumping off the boat, he goes, our father part in heaven. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I do, I do. I was like, I'm hoping you're going to I always find that part so funny. So he's like, oh, our father who are they can't even finish it before the it's uh, <laughs> yeah. You need you need the you need the green goblin to pop up for the first Spider-Man and be like, finish it, finish it. <laughs> oh my god. It's totally insane. That that moment was really great. That was like that was tops. Our father who are I get confused about the the order of things here, and I don't I don't care. If I'm already can. doing it too, and I watch this movie twice within the past like week and a half. I'm so confused. <laughs> uh, so he he's he's escaped from the prison. He runs off with Olga, who I really thought Olga was going to be a, a love interest, but there's no time for that. I thought she was going to make it through the end of the movie. Well, like they, no. there's a part where like he's being tortured by Dakota, and like him and Olga make eyes for a second. You're like, oh, there's something here. here. And of course, she has a almost dies, you know. Then, but then she turns on her 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 team and actually saves Ransom by screaming, so he won't get killed by one of the baddies. And well, yeah, because he he he's in the prison. Uh, you get him meeting uh, Martin Martin Boomer, I think it was Martin the Faint Hearted, as he calls himself. Oh he's my like, god, I, I can't withstand that. physical pain. <laughs> yeah, I uh, forget they, all these people. Yeah, the prisoner who can't take physical pain. He's like, that's why they paired me with you, because you're so brave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I, I, I'm even skipping the part where he's being forced to read. Um, well, that's yeah, that's right before he makes his. Yeah, that's one of the other great Red Brown moments. He's like, he's saying all this and he's like, that's why I want you to keep fighting. Stay here. Give him hell. <laughs> It's one of those things where they, they were trying to do the, the, the to break the morals of, of the, the soldiers listening by having, you know, someone like Ransom, like being being a turncoat and, you know, saying he'd gone to their side. But he uses the mic to do a mic drop of like an inspirational speech. Thank then you for have, catching Yeah, that. part of his escape right out of Rambo 2 where he puts the guy right on the electric, like the little electric fence thing in the, in the hut. <laughs> Very shamelessly <clears throat> ripping off Rambo 2. It's funny, when we get to Strike Commando 2 at some point, like that movie has way more versions of it. Like this is actually fairly tame in terms of the stuff it's ripping off compared to that film. Oh, wow. But uh, anyway, then you have his escape where he grabs like an AK-47, shoots a couple people, uses some grenades, and then he takes the flamethrower in the cave. You have his great scream uh, when he uses the flamethrower. Yes. yes. Surrounds them all with fire. Um, and then he's doing he, he ends up doing like more Rambo two stuff. Like at one point, he uh, he camouflages himself with like a bunch of grass and stabs a guy like just there's, there's, uh, then you have the moment, the great moment, the slow motion moment where he pops up out of the water with the AK-47 and shoots a bunch of people. Oh, man. Well, you know, what's funny is I haven't seen Rambo or Rambo two in well over 30 years. So my brain is like, yeah, I know this has got Rambo stuff in it, but I forget how much Rambo stuff is in that. <laughs> I'm glad I, forgot. well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, oh, it's, 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 it's there. And like, you have two, like the, the, the infamous scene of Rambo, you know, destroying the control room at the end of Rambo two. Um, and then you have two, you basically have two versions of that in this. Cause the Dakota scene is kind of one of those, but then you have it, the, the moment at the end where he goes to control him and he's like, Radic, you traitor. And then he shoots everything in the control room. That's the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But then we get the ultimate fight. We get, well, the first ultimate fight where uh, Ransom takes on Dakota, finally faces him. And uh, this part, this is where the skills of our director are the most 
or stretched the most thin. This fight choreography is hideous. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's pretty terrible, but it's it's pretty entertaining as well. <laughs> it's very entertaining. I like, definitely have, not complaining. You have the one scene where they're charging each other. Oh, and they man. like do this like they both bang their heads and then the makeup on them like as soon as they do that is so, it's such a weird like cut. Then you think the fight's going to go on longer and it just kind of and Ransom just throws him off the waterfall. And yeah. yeah, it's like it's like right after that, like there's no falling action or whatever within this fight. It's just very, very um, it's it yeah. starts off with a lot and then it ends very, very quickly. Yeah, the the headbutt scene is my favorite. That is one of my favorite moments when it's like ah and then the other guys ah and they just butt heads but it's such a non moment like as soon as they collide it's over and i'm like what they oh man it's so good when he throws them off the cliff i i could not have predicted how jakota is going to come back i could not have predicted that i mean how could anyone have predicted that fast forward to the end of the war our pal Ransom is in Saigon and everyone's fleeing to get out of there. But Ransom's just walking down the street, looking like that thousand yard stair broken, like a broken man just carrying that freaking M60 down the street. <laughs> I love that part. It's so like trying to do a deer hunter or a insert any you know quote unquote serious movie about vietnam here where he's got to make a statement you know i love that part it's so good um of course he meets back up with uh his pal harriman harriman and uh harriman gives him the lowdown of where radic is located now so he's got to go and finally settle the score with radock radic well Raddock. and 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 you get the end of the war, but then doesn't it fl- like flash forward to like six months after, and they're both in Manila or something watching yeah. a, a cockfight? Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't need that in my movie. You know, like <laughs> one of the pieces of trivia was that some country just completely cut the cockfighting scene out, and because they cut every time they referred to the cockfighting scene, it was like forty eight cuts had to be made. <laughs> Is that? Is that an actual like? Is that is that a th- like? I didn't even know that that was a thing. Like, is that a thing in other countries? It, oh, oh, making two um, uh, roosters fight each other. Yeah, that's a thing that happened here. That's a thing that used to happen right here in America. There's a movie, um, God, it's called Cockfighter. That was in the <laughs> 70s. Uh, it was um, one of my favorite actors, Warren Oates. Warren Oates, 1974. Oh, I like him. Yeah, I like him. Oh, too. Harry Dean yeah. Stanton. Oh, yeah. Nice. Ed Bagley Jr. I've never seen this movie. I just know about it. I just want Surprised won't watch. it's not directed by Sam Peckinpah if it's a 70s see, movie with Warren Oates in it. See, exactly. But also, Peckinpah, he had that scene in one of his movies where they were shooting the heads off of roosters. So he he loved. Uh yeah. Well, they also they also had oh, like the in, at the beginning of the Wild Bunch, you had the ants and the scorpion. That was yep. that was cool. Yep. Poor scorpion. Um, but yeah, it's it's, it's always there. funny like how many movies you see with with like uh, movies where you'll be in a foreign country and you see stuff like this. Like I always think of uh, the beginning of Casino Royale, where I think it's like the snake and the mongoose in that. Yes. <laughs> oh man what we'll do for where life is cheap that's that's the whole thing <laughs> yeah this doesn't happen in america so he goes to to radic's little headquarters there and he uses another one of his super grenades that has the long fuse on it to scare the secretary <laughs> yeah you got about two minutes to get out of here <laughs> <laughs> but of course this time when he fights uh jakota jakota's got these special dentures <laughs> like like Jaws from uh, good old uh, Moonraker or something. <laughs> I don't understand. Like, we don't know what happened to Jakota's teeth. Did he punch Jakota's teeth out? Was that a thing that happened? No, I, I, we never see that. I, I don't know if he lost him when he went over the waterfall. Like, I don't know if he landed yep. teeth first on a rock or something. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like it's, uh, it's like I, I can't think of any any reason why all of a sudden he would have the have the teeth, but it's it's whatever. Go with then it. He, so he shoves a grenade in his mouth and then blows up Dakota. Then he goes after Radic, 
And this is my last moment from the movie because it's you know, like, like the, the end of the movie, which is um, Raddick is listening to his men getting killed throughout his compound. And he's got his little nine millimeter and he's waiting. Oh, yeah. Um, Michael Ransom, our, our hero, when he smuggled a gun in to this uh, this compound, it looked like maybe an M16 in a, in a, a gun bag. But then it's the M60 again. <laughs> The M60 is a really the M60 is a huge weapon to, to conceal. Like it is a big gun. Ow, ow. But instead of facing Radic, he just yells at him through the door and says "fuck this shit" and then grenade launchers him to a dummy death. <laughs> yeah, which is great. Oh my god! And then one of the best examples of a disclaimer at the end where he does like the whole, it is like any uh, similarities to people living or dead is purely accidental. I'm like, this is like a fourth wall break that yep. is just He's amazing. Right, it's one of the best ever. Talking right to us. It's like, it might be a coincidence, like one in a million. <laughs> yeah. Any similarity between persons living or dead, especially dead. <laughs> It's purely accidental. Yeah. Very accidental. Like one in a million, maybe. That's frickin... Spike Commando, we can't sue them for how similar this movie was to our lives because of that freaking <laughs> that that post credit thing there or pre credit thing there. Yeah. Other than the trivia that I had, a couple pieces like the 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 different version where they cut out the cockfighting and uh, Mr. Mike Monty, the voice actor, was actually William Frickin Burger. Did you have anything else? Do you know anything about this movie? Not too much other than I don't I don't know if you have the sever and Blu-ray. Um, I, do not. I do. Well, so there is an extended cut on there. And Bruno Mattei, a lot of his films for that that Severin put out, there is an extended cut with just like little bits of scenes. And I don't believe I I didn't do any research on this, but there is a scene where um, Lau talks to his sister and he's like, oh, the American would make an ideal husband for you. And I don't think that is in the theatrical yeah. cut. I, I think that's only in the extended cut where that woman seems to there. They seem to hint a little bit more at, at a possible romance between her and Ransom that ends up not being the case, of course. Um, and I think missing in action three uh, totally ripped that plot off, um, actually. <laughs> mm. The other thing was that um, this had clips from The Last Hunter in it. Some of yeah. the, the helicopter footage and the explosions was from that movie. If you watch like Born to Fight and Double Target and any of those movies, there are there is stock footage you can recognize from some of these films that he uses throughout some of the like exploding huts, um, as Severin would call these the exploding hot movies. Um, that's what <laughs> David Gregory always calls these movies. And uh, yeah, he reuses some of the footage for those explosions in a lot of the nice. films and like the helicopters. It's very Godzilla like with how they would always use that same footage for the tanks rolling up on Godzilla. And the tank's getting uh, uh, exploded by Godzilla. Nice. <clears throat> Final thoughts about the movie. How do you uh, how do you feel about frickin' Strike Commando Part 1? It's it's just a really fun film. And there are moments of, I think, the some of his other movies do the, do the shameless rip-off stuff um, a little differently. Like, But this film has a Rambo influence, but it also, it, it works to me as a standalone film just because it's, it's, it's fun enough. There's a lot of explosions. There's some good, like slow motion action. Like there is moments it within this where the action is actually, I wouldn't necessarily say well filmed. It's not necessarily well yeah. crafted, but the budget's <laughs> there. Like there's a budget there for explosions and ammunition that you can feel. And it's, it's done practically unlike most modern movies, the explosions and everything are real. So, oh, yeah. and like even Claudio Fergasso talked about how the, the Filipino <clears throat> um, crew could build like some of these huts, like that scene where ransom destroys like a bridge when he's in the boat, the Filipino crew built that like whole bridge in a day just to wow. be destroyed. So, wow. the, you know, you have different things like that where you could use like little things of production value to, 
to increase the the practicality of some of these explosions and the stunts uh, that are in the film are all pretty good. And I think Red Brown is definitely doing some of his own at times. It looked freaking dangerous. <laughs> but uh, no, I like this one. I um, the seams are showing in some parts, like that that freaking fight choreography. The the little model buildings being blown up too at the beginning. I was thinking about Antonio Margariti when he would do model work too. I loved it. Yeah. The music is jamming. The freaking music is great. The white savior thing was mind blowing. Totally, totally mind destroying. I'm surprised I didn't watch this as a kid because in the late 80s, I was obsessed with guns. I had like 25 different gun books and I would just draw guns all day. I love guns. And so therefore, every action movie was like fair game. If you had a guy with a gun on the cover... And then I went through a phase of renting every Vietnam exploitation movie I could find, like the missing in action movies. And then there was some other American made films that were set in Vietnam that were just like whatever. But I just I can't believe I didn't run across like The Last Hunter or run across this. Like even the the David A. Pryor one. Deadly I, Prey. Uh yeah, I've still never seen Deadly Prey. I watched um David A. Pryor's first one where it's so weird where it doesn't take place in Vietnam. It's people like pretending to be in Vietnam, pretending to be in Vietnam to train each other. How was that movie called? It was bizarre kill zone. Yeah. I've heard of that one. Yeah. Kill zone bizarre. Cause it doesn't actually take place in Vietnam. It has a flashback to wherever they filmed, you know, in California, that's supposed to be Vietnam. But then the whole thing is that they're using these tactics to train these guys to be better soldiers and manage to drive one of the soldiers insane where he thinks he's back in Nam and hilarity ensues. But yeah, I never got to this one, Uh, but now I'm glad I did. And I'm very curious about the sequel because. Yeah. And it's interesting because in the late eighties and early nineties, you had, um, and it's a genre I haven't gotten into much yet, although eventually I want to, were those like B action movies. And this would, this would fall into that category, even though it's still part of the Italian, uh, genre, uh, like the non-exploitation genre as well. But, um, like you had a lot of, um, movies that like Richard Harrison was doing with Godfrey Ho as an example of those kind of B action movies that were being made around that time. So before we go, I ask my my guests a question, and that is, tell me about a I guess this is more of a statement. Uh, Tell me about a recently seen and loved film. So one film you've seen recently, any genre doesn't even matter as long as you enjoyed it and could be a first time watch or something you've seen a million times. Do you have a favorite recent one you saw? Um, there were a couple because I've been watching some Hong Kong uh, cinema lately. Yes, uh, I watched. I, uh, I, I watched uh, Thirty Six Chamber of Shaolin for the first time. Love that movie. Ooh, nice. Another one. Another one I watched, which is a little bit less known from uh, from that movie. So I'll talk about it. It's a movie called Undeclared War. It's a movie that Ringo Lamb directed in the early nineties. Oh. It's uh, I think it's I believe it's a Golden Harvest movie and it's it's one of those Hong Kong action movies and it's got <laughs> Vernon Wells playing like this uh, this revolutionary terrorist in it and Olivia Hussey what? also playing uh, like a terrorist as well and um, the guy from Ghoulies I can't remember his name Peter or something is the actor teams yeah, up yeah. with Danny Lee from The Killer and it's almost like a buddy cop movie between those two trying to take down Vernon Wells as this uh, as this terrorist who's like a master of disguise. It's it's some of the most fun I've ever seen Vernon Wells have in a movie, actually. You know, I want to say, did this get a Blu-ray recently? It did. It got a Vinegar Syndrome one. That's how I watched it. Got it. That's where I've heard of it. Man, that that cast and that plot sounds great. Holy shit. Um, I'm going to stick with, uh, with Asia as well in Hong Kong with a little movie called The Blue Gene Monster. From 1991, which is a interesting movie, it is a lead role for the heavy uh, Fuyan Shing. Who, if you look up Fuyan Shing, that guy, you've seen him before. If you've seen any Hong Kong action movies or comedies or anything, he's all over the place. But this was a leading role for him as the hero. Blue Jean Monster is stupid, stupid. 
it, the comedy is puerile and embarrassing at times. Um, the horror stuff is really gross and nasty. And I don't know what I saw, but 88 films brought this out on Blu-ray. And I thought for years that it was like a, a, a like a gritty, nasty, uh, like category three rape movie or something because of the title and because <laughs> Fu Yan Shing was the lead. But nope. It's just a weird, gross-out comedy horror movie that I recommend. <laughs> but it's real dumb. It's really dumb. I can't stress that enough. Well, sir, thank you for joining me. Yeah. And thank you for bringing Strike Commando into my life. Uh, would you like to talk about some of the things that you do? Because I want you to promote, promote, promote. Yeah, um, I'm on uh, the Land of the Creeps podcast every couple weeks on the uh, Double Double episodes, uh, part of the Black Glove uh, mystery segment where me and uh, Greg Morgan, a.k.a. Greg Amortis, uh, talk uh, Giallo movies mostly and really just anything yes. from Italian genre uh, cinema. Uh, I have my own blog, The Good, The Bad, and The Macabre.blogspot.com. Uh, you can... Find me on Twitter or X and Instagram at Erzonomics, and you can add me on Facebook if you want. I sadly did not pass my erg- my Erzonomics courses. <laughs> now I'm making up for it. All right, man. Well, thank you once again for being here, and uh, we'll definitely have you back. I- I'm intrigued by Strike Commando 2. I'm, I'm intrigued by other picks because you might be leading me down a totally new avenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, we'll have uh, Strike Commando 2. We'll have we'll look forward to Richard Harris absolutely slubbing it in a role. It's just like I, I couldn't believe that he was in it when I first when I first read about it. Like on the Severn Blu-ray, they say Richard Harris. And they they have in parentheses. Yes, that Richard Harris. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, looking forward to that. All right, folks. I'm a man called horse. Bye. Folks, thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you'd like to write into the show, send an email to doomedmoviethon at gmail, or hit us up at doomedmoviethon on Instagram, or at doomedmoviethon on Twitter, or at doomedmoviethon at Discord, or go to Hello, This is the Doomed Show on Facebook and message us there. If you want more Hello, This is the Doomed Show... Go to doomedmoviethon.com and click the podcast button for the archive. Or go to YouTube and look up Doomed Moviethon and you'll find the classic episodes of Hello, This is the Doomed Show. And if that's still not enough, um, I have written some books, you know, about my love of movies over on Amazon.com. Uh, just look up Richard Glenn Schmidt and you'll find Giallo Meltdown, A Moviethon Diary, Giallo Meltdown 2, Cinema Somnambulist, or Doomed Moviethon, the book. Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Go to legionpodcast.com and check out the other great shows over there. <laughs>